Well, welcome back everybody to part three of my series on Lloyd de Moss. Today we're going to be going through chapter six, but I figured we would just stop through chapter five for a second because it's on the seven phases of going to war, and he mentions this concept in chapter six. So just so we're not completely out of the loop, I thought I would show you what he's talking about here. You know, the first part, the first phase is freedom, increasing in independence, innovations, and a growth of real self. Phase two is growth panic, loss of parental approval, disintegration of real self. Number three is fission. You're splitting into in-group and out-group fusion, merging with powerful, punishing, killer motherland fracture. You project the projection of bad self into helpless victim enemy. Uh, phase six is faking a provocative attack by that enemy. And phase seven is fight. Becoming the hero of the killer motherland means sacrificed for her while killing the bad self enemy. Anyways, that's um, the seven phases of going to war. And he mentions that, so I thought I would just show it before we move on. So without further ado, let's get into it. World War II and the Holocaust have been studied by historians and political scientists more than any war in history. Their conclusions about what caused them are that Germans were simply obeying Hitler, a case of mass hypnosis by one man. Historians are rightly nearly unanimous that the causes of the Second World War were the personality and the aims of Adolf Hitler. The war Hitler started was one which he alone wanted. Only one European really wanted war, Adolf Hitler. No Hitler, no Holocaust. Psychiatrists have usually followed the lead of historians, claiming, for instance, that they could find no psychopathology in the Nazi leaders who were given the Rorschach tests at Nuremberg. They were all too normal people, and their mass murders were committed by well-integrated, productive, and secure personalities who were merely obeying orders. That a theory which posits millions of people chose a leader who promises them they can kill millions of other people only because they were following orders is a pure tautology never occurs to them. When Eichmann bragged, I laughed that I have killed five million Jews, and psychiatrists claim his statement was normal, it demonstrates not the banality of evil, but the banality of psychiatry. So you can see, he's already very embracing of boomer truth. He, he's not questioning the narrative in any way. O only to say that psychology is wrong here, and that there's much deeper reasons for why the Germans did what they did. When states go to war because they reenact the nightmares of child abuse that are embedded like time bombs in their brains, in violent altars, and if they usually do so when they experience growth panic following an historic period of dangerous new freedom and growth, then each phase of going to war should betray historical evidence of real childhood traumas being re-experienced. In order to understand the traumatic nightmares being acted out in World War II and the Holocaust, we will first have to understand in detail the nightmarish terrors of German, Austrian, and Japanese child rearing at the beginning of the 20th century. Because more psychohistorical research has been done on Central European child rearing than on Japanese, we will begin with a detailed description of child rearing in Germany and Austria. We will then more briefly describe Japanese child rearing and, show, and finally show how both nations went to war in the seven group fantasy phases described above, aided by similar sacrificial actions by the Allies that helped produce the war and genocide. Late 19th century German and Austrian child rearing. The first decision German and Austrian parents had to make when an infant was born was whether it should be killed. Newborn were not in most cases considered human since they did not yet have a soul, and so could be killed in a kind of late abortion. Mothers often had their babies in the privy and treated birth as an evacuation, a bowel movement, killing their children by smashing their heads like poultry. Even the underestimated figures given by officials show German infanticide at the end of the 20th century as 20%, half again higher than France and England. Infant mortality in Bavaria, where breastfeeding was rare, was given as 
and was probably closer to 75%, which meant almost every child watched their mothers strangle or otherwise kill their siblings when born. Mothers were described as being without remorse as they killed their newborn. Children routinely saw dead babies in sewers, on roads, and in streams as they played. From early childhood on, German children experienced in direct form the terror of seeing babies killed without remorse by their killer mothers, imagining that the babies must have been bad to, deser to deserve their fate, and embedded in their amygdalan networks both a killer mother altar and a bad baby altar, vowing to always obey their parents and any other authority so that they would not also be killed. Dix found that Nazis had particularly destructive mother images, and the Oliners found German rescuers of Jews had families that showed them more love and respect than Nazi parents. Polls of the Germans at the time show the majority were also routinely beaten by their fathers and considered him absolute law in the family. We feared him more than we loved him. That real mothers regularly killed their newborn infants saying that they were unworthy of living formed the main source of later German delusions that Jews, Poles, Gypsies, Russians, French, British, American, and other neighbors were unworthy of living and must be killed by the millions, 50 million in fact, an act embedded in their right brains as they watched their killer mothers murder their siblings. <laughs> okay, we're getting into woo-woo territory here. When Hitler said that France, the mortal enemy of our nation, inexorably strangles us, he was not, as most historians assume, just being colorful. He was expressing his and his fellow Germans' experience of actually seeing their killer mothers strangling their infant siblings. Most of Germany agreed with him that their 1939 attack on Poland that started World War II was defensive, since they were faced with the harsh alternatives of striking or of certain annihilation. The killer mother memory may have totally been in their heads rather than in reality, but it seemed more real than anything outside could be. And that Jews were for centuries really killer mothers was proven by German convictions since the 13th century that Jews drained children's blood and killed them, called the blood libel by historians. Luther reflected the widespread German group fantasy by calling Jews thirsty bloodhounds and murderers of children. And German social Darwinists revealed the maternal model for the murder of millions by saying they were only imitating Mother Nature who weeds out the weakest ones. Again, a description of the actual German mothers who weeded out some of her newborn infants. It should not be thought that the killing of newborn was mainly a result of poverty. In fact, my lengthy study of boy-girl ratios as a revealing index of infanticide, since little girl babies were more unworthy of living than boys, shows more infanticide in wealthier, in wealthier families. And visitors to Germany in the 19th century reported, it is extremely rare for a German lady to nourish her own children, and it would have been very astonishing indeed if a well-to-do mother had suggested suckling her own baby, saying it's too messy, or they didn't want to ruin their figures, or breastfeeding was inconvenient. Wet nurses were commonly given the newborn, and more often than not, they were killing nurses, termed Ingol Merkrin, angel makers, who were paid to kill off the children sent to them. The children of the wet nurse would watch their mother briefly give the new baby her breast, saying, Poor, poor little one, soon you will go, soon, soon, and see the child was dead by the morning. German children who watched their parents and send their newborn siblings off to wet nurses implanted this image in their violent altars and repeated their actions in the resettlement of millions of Jews and Poles and others when they became adults. Even if the mother breastfed her baby, it was only a few times a day, and the rest of the time it was abandoned to a cradle in a dark room, wrapped in tight swaddling bandages with their mouths stuffed with zloop a linen bag filled with bread and alcohol, so those dying of neglect and starvation ranged from a quarter to half in their first year of life. Infants were so routinely hungry that one rarely encounters a German infant who is fully breastfed. Those poor worms get their mouths stuffed with a dirty rag containing chewed bread so that they cannot scream. Children were simply not felt to be human, 
like adults. When they were infants and little children, their parents constantly told them that they were just useless mouths to feed. Rarely could we eat a piece of bread without hearing Father's comment that, do, that we did not merit it. Indeed, fathers were competitors to their babies for their wives' breasts. In Bavaria, for instance, where breastfeeding by the mother was uncommon, a man married a woman from northern Germany, and when she had her baby, the jealous father told her that nursing her child was swinish and filthy, and he himself would not eat if she did not give up this disgusting habit. The phrase applied to children, useless mouths to feed, was widely repeated before and during World War II to apply to the wish of the Germans and Austrians to kill 30 to 50 million useless mouths in Europe. From Jews to any outside enemy who was attacked, their need had nothing to do with anything economic, as Goring put it in 1941. This year, 20 to 30 million people will starve in Russia. Perhaps this is for the best, since certain nations must be decimated. The same infantile starvation fantasy was evident in many other Nazi notions, such as their supposed need to kill others to obtain more Lebensraum, more room to grow food, to prevent imminent starvation, a situation that simply did not apply to Central Europe, which had plenty of resources to incre increase their supply of food. Hitler's conviction that Mother Germany did not have enough Lebensraum to properly feed the nation came directly from his memory of his infantile hunger, since mothers in Brenau, where he was raised, rarely breastfed their infants. The shortage of Lebensraum, room to live, had a second source in childhood. Upon birth, the wretched newborn little thing was wound up in L's of bandages, from the feet right and tight up to the neck, as if it were intended to be embalmed as a mummy. Babies are loathsome, foated things, offensive to the last degree with their excreta. Babies simply could not move for their first year of life. A visitor from England described the German baby as a hideous object. It is pinioned and bound up like a mummy in yards of bandages. It is never bathed. Its head is never touched with soap and water until it is eight or ten months old. Their feces and urine was so regularly left on their bodies that they were covered with lice and other vermin attracted to their excreta. And since the swaddling bandages were very tight and covered their arms as well as their bodies, they could not prevent the German from, from drinking their blood. Their parents considered them so disgusting, they called them filthy, lice-covered babies and often put them swaddled in a bag, which they hung on the wall or on a tree while the mothers did other tasks. The fear of being poisoned by lice was daily embedded in the fearful altar of the baby and was as an adult re-experienced as a fear of Jews being filthy lice who attempted to infect the pure German blood and who had to be exterminated to cleanse the German bloodstream. Germany, Hitler said, had to restore its 1914 borders to get an influx of fresh blood because the Polish corridor is a national wound that bleeds continuously. Infancy and swaddling bands was re-experienced. Poisonous bacilli were sucking out our blood and injecting a continuous stream of poison into our blood vessels. Now here comes some boomer truth. Are you ready? Nazi house cleaning of the unfit began early on with 800,000 children having their blood taken to analyze its purity. And over 70,000 useless eater children were exterminated in the first gas chambers and crematorium ovens before any Jews were sent to gas chambers to clean and disinfect the nation. Eventually, Jews and other useless eaters were sent to gas chambers run by doctors claiming that they were filthy lice who attempted to infect the pure German blood, who had to be exterminated to cleanse the bacteria that brought about infection. Himmler explained the childhood origins of the Jewish bacteria delusion as follows. Anti-Semitism is exactly like delousing. The removal of lice is not an ideological question, but a matter of hygiene. Hitler himself used to watch for hours as his own blood was being sucked by leeches to rid it of poison. Jews were rounded up and made into bad selves, shit babies, putting themselves into overcrowded death camps and telling them, You'll be eaten by lice, 
you'll rot in your own shit. All are going to die. Jews were called pestiferous bacillus carriers, made to live like lice-covered babies, forced to lie in barracks like they themselves were forced to live in their swaddling bands, awash with urine and feces, forced to eat their own feces, and finally dying in showers covered with their excrement. Repeating their parents' curses at them as shit babies, their guards told them, you'll be eaten by lice. You'll rot in your own shit, you filthy shit face. As they killed Jews, guards told them what they imagined their mothers felt as they killed their newborn siblings. Because you're dirty, you'll have to die. They were all bad shit babies. They had to die. And if they were not killed, Nazis said they would gobble up the breast of Germany. <laughs> now, do you believe that? I don't know. Part of me believes that the first part he's describing, like, I, I kind of, un like, the child abuse is believable. I believe that, sure, that, that's a possibility. Maybe it really was bad for children in Weimar Germany. And they grew up to be, to fix it. You know, they, they grew up in an attempt to try to get rid of all that. And, and they swung too far. But the boomer truth, you know, boomer truth just has to go way more. Just... Any accusations of anything bad against Jews always has to be just the most crazy, hyperbolic thing you've ever heard of in your life. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. The abandonment of children was not limited to sending them to wet nurses. Children were given away and even sold to relatives, neighbors, foundling homes, and even traveling scholars to be used as beggars, with the rationalization that this was so they could be drilled for hard work and learn discipline. If a German newborn was allowed to live, it was then subjected to the most horrifying tortures that can be inflicted upon children, every detail of which became indelibly imprinted on their early amygdalan fear system and then reinflicted upon enemies during the war and the Holocaust. The restrictions of the first year of tight swallowing were continued in subsequent years by putting them in various restraint devices, steel stayed corsets worn by both sexes, steel collars and backboards strapped to the waist, all to ensure they would not become tyrants. The endless encirclement fears of childhood were implanted in German altars and re-experienced in the constant fear of Germany itself being encircled by enemies, even when, as with the British and Soviets in the interwar period, they continually denied all charges of encirclement. Hitler, from the first, used swaddling and restraint language all the time to describe Germany's emotional plight. Germany is bound head and foot by peace treaties, and they must go to war in order to breathe more freely. Restrictive, abandoning German child-rearing guaranteed sacrificial war when they were adults. Even monkeys who are reared in isolation and restriction grow up vicious and self-mutilating. Now here comes some more woo-woo. I, I don't know. Maybe it's not woo-woo. This could be real. I, who knows? Let's, let's read it and find out. <laughs> let's see what you think. The traditional German obsession with children's feces continued after swaddling ended by the regular use of enemas as a maternal domination device, a fetish object often welded by the mother or nurse in daily rituals that resembled sexual assaults on the anus sometimes including tying the child up in leather straps as though the mother were a dominatrix, inserting the two-foot-long enema tube over and over again as punishment for accidents. There were special enema stores that German children would be taken to in order to be fitted for their proper size of enemas. Mothers had an intensive fear of the notorious smell of the small child, which made them give daily enemas to prevent them from becoming a relentless house tyrant. The ritual stab in the back was a central fear of German children well into the 20th century, and they learned never to speak of it, but always to think about it. Enema fears, of course, were re-experienced in the stab in the back fruit fantasy that Germans kept referring to when they imagined the Versailles Treaty was agreed to by German socialists without Germany ever having been defeated in World War I. Sexual molestation of children was routine and considered normal. When infants were removed from their cribs, they usually slept in the family bed and either were made part of the sexual act or regularly witnessed it close up. 
Bloch reported the seduction of children in Germany was very widespread, and German doctors reported nursemaids and other servants carry out all sorts of sexual acts on the children entrusted to their care, sometimes merely in order to quiet the children, sometimes for fun. Freud's parents, and Freud himself, said they were seduced by their nurses who put crying children to sleep by stroking their genitals. Little Hans slept with his mother for four years and told Freud his mother said if he touched his penis, she would cut it off. Priests used children for sex too. Both boys and girls regularly were raped in schools by teachers and older students, and there were even special schools espousing pedagogical eros, the benefits of teachers using students for sex to help learning. Plus, of course, most girls, most young girls and boys were sexually assaulted as servants and apprentices. There were all kinds of obedience rituals in German families that were designed to make the child always good that were commented upon outsiders at the time as being particularly violent. Kind words were rare in German homes, and most Germans remembered no tender word, no caresses, only fear during childhood. Children were regularly placed on a red-hot iron stone, if obstinate, tied to their bedposts for days, thrown into cold water or snow to harden them, forced to kneel for hours every day against the wall on a log while the parents ate and read, and frightened by parents dressing up in terrifying ghost costumes and pretending to eat up and kill them for their transgressions. Scheck sums up the effects of these terrifying devices. Most children had been so deeply frightened that their demons of childhood persecuted them at night and in feverish dreams for their whole lives. The apocalyptic group fantasies of Nazism were direct results of these childhood nightmares. That's a pretty bold claim. So in this next chapter, he's going to talk about the physical abuse that German children went through. I'm going to start it off um, right about here. The motto of German parents for centuries was children can never get enough beatings. They were not just spankings. They were beatings with instruments or whippings, like Hitler's daily whippings with a dog whip, which often put him into a coma. As Fuhrer, Hitler used to carry a dog whip with him as he gave orders to be carried out. It is not surprising that German childhood suicides were three to five times higher than other Western European nations at the end of the 19th century, fears of beatings by parents being the reason cited by children for their suicides. No one spoke up for the children, newspapers wrote. Boy who commits suicide because of a box on the ears has earned his fate. The beatings continued at school where we were beaten until our skin smoked. Children could be heard screaming on the streets each morning as they were dragged to school by their mothers. The schoolmaster, who boasted he had given... <laughs> no, <laughs> where did he find this? The schoolmaster, who boasted he had given 911,527 strokes with the stick and 124,000 lashes with the whip to students, was not that unusual for the time. Comparisons of German and French childhoods in the late 19th century found no bright moment, no sunbeam, no hint of a comfortable home with mother love and care. In the German ones, with sexual molestation and beatings at home and at school consistently worse in the German accounts. In's massive study of German autobiographies at the time found infant mortality, corporal punishment, and cruelties against children were so brutal that he had to apologize for not dealing with the brighter side of German childhood because it turns out there is no bright side. Other studies found most Germans remembered no tender word, no caresses, only fear with childhood, so joyless and so immeasurably sad that you couldn't fathom it. When Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf that the German people today lies broken and defenseless, exposed to the kicks of all the world, both he and his reading audience read this not as a political metaphor, but as the real kicks of their parents and teachers and real memories of lying broken and defenseless. The tortures of childhood were far more traumatic and consistent than the later studies of authoritarianism ever imagined. There was a good reason that Germans and Austrians spoke so often about their, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, but rage towards children. 
and it is this rage that is embedded in the early violent amygdalin altars which is inflicted upon others in World War II and the Holocaust. The child-hitting hand was even the symbol of Nazi obedience, since the Nazi salute endlessly displayed the open palm of their beating parents as they fused them flush with opioids. <laughs> wow, what a sentence. Ghosts from the nursery, embedded by the extremely insecurely attached children, were displayed everywhere in Nazi Germany. To imagine tens of millions of people just obeying Hitler as though there were no inner compulsion to inflict their nightmarish earlier childhood tortures on others is simply absurd. Okay, so this next part is going to be on how Japan raised their kids. All of the routine child abuse described above for Central European families was common in Japan at the turn of the 20th century. Infanticide was so common, it was accepted as a form of family planning, killing either boy or girl newborn babies in murders called thinning out. As siblings watched their mothers bury the newborn, they, like Germans, imagined it was because they were weak, bad babies, embedding this fear in their altars and revived the fear of being killed by enemies when their society was changing so fast during their industrial and cultural expansion. Despite the fact that Japan had grown economically three times as fast as the U.S. during the interwar period, they claimed before attacking Pearl Harbor that the attack was necessary because Japan was getting weaker, and the enemy is getting strong, and we won't be able to survive unless we attack. Even though no nation was threatening to conquer Japan in 1941, their amygdalin fearful altar memory of watching their mothers commit infanticide by the millions told them, as they put it, the very existence of weak little Japan was now a matter of life and death, and they were about to be strangled. Japanese babies at birth were wrapped with a futon and encased in a restrictive ijoko box so they could not move, and kept tied up in it much of the time for three or four years as late as the early 20th century, producing fears of being restricted and encircled, identical to those of Germans and Austrians. All the other abuses described above were in constant use by the Japanese parents, beating and burning of incense on the skin as routine punishments, cruel bowel training with constant enemas, frightening children with ghosts, kicking, hanging by the feet, giving cold showers, strangling, driving a needle into the body, cutting off a finger joint, putting the child outside the house at night, dressing up as a ghost to frighten the child, and telling visitors to take this child away, we don't want it. But it is in the practice of the sexual use of children that earlier Japanese excelled even more than Germans and Austrians. Imperial incest was common, and Japanese fathers until recently would marry their daughters after the death of their wives, considering incest a, pra a praiseworthy practice. Samurai warriors, priests, and other elite historically favored using young boys for anal pederastic sex, finding them preferable to sex with their subordained wives. Boy geishas and prostitutes were rife until recently. Because Japanese husbands so rarely come home at night, going to geisha or other women for sex, their mothers are desperately lonely, and so routinely co-sleeping with their children skin to skin and co-bathing until they were grown up. Even today, many Japanese mothers masturbate their children in public, in bed, to put them to sleep and during co-bathing, sometimes promising to let them have intercourse with them if they do well on their next school test. Childhood sexual abuse, I have found, leads nations to more self-destructive than just the violent behavior instilled by beatings. Japanese childhood, therefore, contained at least as much abuse and neglect as Central European, and as these two areas contained the most powerful democratizing political nations in the world in the 1920s, they experienced the most fearful growth panic by their populace in reaction to the democratic freedoms introduced by their transitional democracies, and reacted by fusing their killer mother lands and going to war. Well, this is where I'm going to end it. He goes on to describe the different phases and how each one could be used to describe what Germany and Austria went through. But to me, the most interesting parts of this article is on the child abuse that children experienced in Germany. And I do wonder if there's something to that.
this video has went on for so long and so I won't go on any further, but I might make a video essay summarizing my thoughts on it and child abuse in general. It's kind of a topic I'm I'm very interested in and I've spent a lot of time thinking about, but I just haven't really included it in my previous videos. Anyways, thanks for watching and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.